This is Phil Koopman with a tutorial on avoiding single points of failure. Single points of failure are specific places in the design that can cause the system to fail or be dangerous even if it's just one component that happens to fail. If you are building a system that is life critical or highly mission critical, then it is important to avoid the following problems in this area. Your system must not have any hardware single points of failure. Usually this means designing your system so that it is safe even if any single hardware component should fail. You should also have no multiple point failures that are sufficiently likely to occur in a correlated way. You should not be making any assumptions that the failures will be well behaved, such as assuming that computers will simply crash instead of sending erroneous data. Finally, you should not assume that software components will fail independently unless you can demonstrate that the software failures are uncorrelated and diverse, or that the software in general will not fail because it has been developed to a high safety integrity level. A general way to think about single points of failure is that your system is divided up into one or more fault containment regions, abbreviated as FCR. The first half of the definition of an FCR is that the faults from outside the region stay out. That means that, for example, corrupted or invalid input values have to be caught at the FCR boundary and cannot cause components inside the FCR to crash or otherwise fail. The second half of the definition of an FCR is that any fault inside the FCR stays inside the FCR and cannot have its effects escape the FCR boundary. In other words, the idea of an FCR is that faults inside stay inside the boundary, faults outside stay outside, and the effect of a fault cannot cross an FCR boundary. FCRs are an essential building block for safety critical systems, but there's a catch. The catch is if you're inside an FCR, all bets are off as to what a fault might do inside its own region. A fault inside an FCR has arbitrarily bad effects and might be extremely poorly behaved. Many failures might be pretty simple, such as a system crash or watchdog timer reset. While these could be dangerous, at least they're the sort of thing you should be able to predict and design countermeasures for. But sometimes, even just a single bit in memory flipping can cause the system to go berserk and become actively dangerous. If you're skeptical of that, consider what if that bit flip happens to be in the program counter value, or a bit in the stack pointer, or a bit in memory that's used as a return address from a subroutine call which goes into the program counter. Thus, for the purpose of determining system safety, any fault can have arbitrarily bad effects and, loosely speaking, can look like a shotgun blast going through the FCR. It's basically impossible to predict with any confidence exactly what the worst-case behavior of an FCR will be once even a small fault has occurred. Thus, one assumes that arbitrarily bad behaviors will happen. It should be noted that the concept of an FCR can apply both to software bugs as well as hardware faults. A famously flawed safety critical system was the electronic throttle control system in model year 2002 through 2010 Toyota vehicles. That system was said to cause unintended acceleration, abbreviated as UA. UA, due to vehicle defects, was thought to be the cause of perhaps 89 deaths and resulted in many hundreds of lawsuits for death and serious injury. A class action lawsuit in the U.S. settled for more than $1 billion in addition to settlements from the many death and injury cases. In the one public trial that concentrated on the safety of this computer system, a jury found that not only was the system defective, but that Toyota had acted in reckless disregard, triggering a punitive damages trial phase. Many of the issues in that public case had to do with software quality. But there was also a safety problem contributed by a single point of failure in the hardware of Toyota's electronic throttle control. 
This is a simplified diagram of the ETCS taken from NASA's analysis of that system. You can see that there are two voltages from two different sensors on the accelerator pedal. That way, if one of the accelerator pedal sensors fails, the system is designed for there to be another sensor so you can detect that failure. However, both copies of the accelerator pedal sensor go through the same analog to digital converter on the same chip. Because a defect or disruption in the operation of that one ADD converter can affect the processing of both accelerator pedal sensor voltages, this is a dangerous single point of failure in the system design. The problem is that the other chip, the main CPU, has no independent way to receive accelerator pedal information. Among other things, this arrangement can result in what amounts to an electronically stuck accelerator pedal, meaning that the defect in the blue monitor chip could in effect result in a lie to the main CPU about the accelerator pedal position, and there would really be no way for the main CPU to know that that's what was happening. So what we see in this system is that Toyota did not implement two fault containment regions. That's because a fault inside the blue monitor chip can escape, and a fault from outside the main CPU can enter and cause unsafe behavior. Eliminating single points of failure requires the use of redundancy. If your system must be more reliable than the reliability limit imposed by individual component failure rates, then redundancy is the only way to meet your system reliability goals. Typically, redundancy must be used if you wish to do better than about one critical system failure every 100,000 hours, depending on your system design. Generally, this corresponds to the level of reliability expected of systems that could cause death of a person or catastrophic results to a business. If you're building such a system, you need to make sure that not only do you have redundancy to survive such failures, but also that the redundancy has no single points of failure. That's because even if you have lots of redundancy, any single point of failure component is an Achilles heel for your system. To avoid single points of failure, you need multiple computation paths through your system. Those paths should cross-check each other to catch inconsistencies and thus detect component failures. It is important to realize that two copies of the same software running on two CPUs will protect against hardware failures, but can still, for practical purposes, be a single point of software failure because software bugs will affect both CPUs at the same time. There are three major patterns for avoiding single points of failure. The first is the multi-channel architecture pattern. This uses two or more computers to perform redundant computations and cross-check the results. A common way this pattern appears in embedded systems is the so-called two-of-two two pattern. Two computers called channel one and channel two cross-check their computations and also check the outputs of the other channel. Each channel is designed to be a separate fault containment region. Any mismatch between channel outputs indicates a computational failure. A two-of-two two architecture can be extremely effective at mitigating hardware faults. However, because the same software is running in both channels, the software must, for practical purposes, be perfect by, for example, developing that software to a high safety integrity level. A second common pattern is the doer checker pattern, sometimes called a monitor actuator pair. In this approach, a doer fault containment region performs the primary computation and generates an output to the controlled system. A checker fault containment region is continuously checking the output and does a system safety shutdown if the output is unsafe. You should note that the output could be momentarily unsafe while the shutdown is occurring, but in many systems this is fine because no actual damage can be done in that small amount of time. A doer checker approach can be attractive because the checker can often be built out of simpler hardware than the doer and have simpler software that is easier to get right. Because the doer and checker often are somewhat diverse, that diversity provides an additional argument for independent software failures. 
However, to argue that diversity provides safety requires significant effort to demonstrate actual diversity between the Dewar and Checker software. The third pattern is a variant of the Dewar Checker pattern and is called the safety gate pattern. In this architectural pattern, a Dewar computes an output value and sends it to both a safety gate and a checker. The checker opens or closes the safety gate depending on whether the output looks safe. This avoids the momentary vulnerability of a plain Dewar checker because unsafe outputs are never passed through the gate. However, it does come at the cost of a delay waiting for the checker to complete its check, and also the need to have a safety gate that is in itself not a single point of failure. More exotic and complex patterns can be found in extremely high integrity systems such as flight controls. For example, a multi-channel system with a voter is commonly used, but it's important to make sure the voter doesn't turn into a single point of failure. Concepts closely related to single points of failure are correlated and accumulated faults. Correlated faults happen if there are multiple fault containment regions that have some reason that makes them likely to fail together. Some of these reasons include the following. You could have common design faults, such as the same defective software running in multiple fault containment regions. Well, when that software defect hits, all the FCRs will fail together. You could have common manufacturing faults, such as improperly designed or out-of-spec components. You could have shared infrastructure, such as a shared power supply or a shared clock signal. You can also have physical coupling. For example, you could have two supposedly redundant wires that run through the same wiring harness and are subject to the same failures, such as a loose connector or the two wires shorting together with each other. Or you could have a shared location that gets thermally overloaded or for other reasons causes a correlated failure. The point with correlated faults is that they really are basically single points of failure because there's some single event or single cause that can cause multiple supposed fault containment regions to fail together. The point is that correlated faults are really single points of failure, and that's because there's some phenomenon that can cause multiple fault containment regions to fail together, meaning they're not independent. There's also the notion of accumulated faults. Accumulated faults happen when an FCR has a fault that is either not detected or not repaired. The problem here is that if your reliability math assumes you have multiple redundant fault containment regions, you're also assuming that they're actually working. If they're not working, you have a false sense of security. As a very simple example, consider that commercial airliners have two engines or more. The safety case is basically, if you have two engines when you take off, even if one dies, you have a second one that you can use to land. But that reasoning doesn't work if on the previous flight, one of the two engines failed and you didn't fix it before the next takeoff. It is essential to detect and repair faults in a timely manner and to take into account the possibility that you have faulty units during a mission when you do your redundancy calculations. Best practices to avoid single points of failure revolve around proper use of multiple fault containment regions. To do this, first use hardware redundancy to provide multiple FCRs and hardware isolation between FCRs so that each will fail independently. Typically, each FCR needs to be an independent integrated circuit chip to avoid unforeseen coupling mechanisms within a single chip that can cause correlated failures across that one chip. This means that unless you have a chip that has been certified for the safety level you need, simply using a multi-core chip will not give you sufficient isolation even if the operating system promises some isolation between tasks. Software across multiple fault containment regions needs to avoid correlated failures. This is typically achieved by making at least some of the software perfect for practical purposes via using a high safety integrity level development process. The natural diversity between a doer and a checker may provide some benefit, but you cannot take full credit for it unless you've been very careful to design and prove independence of failures. A pattern commonly used in mission-critical embedded systems is the multi-channel architecture 
typically in the form of a two of two cross checking pair. The second commonly used pattern is the doer checker pattern. A third pattern sometimes used is the safety gate added to a doer checker pair. The pitfalls in avoiding single points of failure are numerous and sometimes quite subtle. Some big ones include two copies of the same software or even just similar software will often fail in exactly the same way because they have the same software bugs. Thus, you cannot assume independence of software failure without special effort. For practical purposes, the best way to deal with this is usually to use a high safety integrity level engineering process to make sure your software is perfect for practical purposes. It is important in a multi-channel architecture to make sure the system does not fail by always trusting one channel, even if that's the faulty channel. The safety gate architecture can have the same problem in that the gate can decide that it's always going to let the outputs through, even if the checker tells it to shut down. In a doer checker architecture, it is important to ensure the checker is actually working and has not failed in a way that just permits all outputs to go out, whether safe or not. Often, the most difficult part of getting safety critical designs right is looking for hidden causes of correlated failures. This could include hardware design defects on multiple chips, shared software libraries, defects in requirements used to design hopefully diverse components, a shared faulty time source, a shared faulty power supply, and the list goes on. 